Movie buff specialist Phil and John are back as we continue counting down our favorite 100 movies of all time. And today we are going to number 58, right? Number 58? Yes. Okay, good. Number 58, good. In the corner, it wasn't there. Episode number 43, it cuts it off on the top of StreamYard here. Um, episode number 43, and we're going to be talking about Donnie Darko, which is a cult classic, and we're going to be talking about Inland Empire, which I have replacing Mulholland Drive. It was David Lynch's final um feature length movie since he's done so much other stuff since then but this was actually the last feature length film he made it was the follow-up to Mulholland Drive so I figured it was a good one to use as this and it is batshit bonkers weird um but yeah this is our number 58 welcome to episode number 43 can't believe we're almost halfway done with this John how's everything going how'd you feel about doing these two movies at the same time uh, it's going really well, and I don't think there's any other possible way for us to describe Donnie Darko, which is this Lynchian cult, cult classic, other than pairing it with an actual David Lynch film. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Donnie Darko so, draws so much inspiration from Lynch. And obviously, it came out around the same time as Mulholland Drive, so it's not pulling from mm -hmm. that, but Wild at Heart, Lost Highway... All of these weird Lynch motifs, this darkness, whatever's going on. And then Inland Empire is actually a David Lynch movie. That is just is. friggin' weird. Um, I have some good quotes that I can pull up for this one because they really are hilarious. But uh, we're going to be starting, I think, with Inland Empire, right? Because I think Donnie Darko... Yeah. I think Donnie Darko's fallen off a bit, though, in recent years, huh? It was a cult classic mm -hmm. at the time, but has it really stood the test of time? Or is it really only people our age who talk about that movie? It's a good question. I don't know if it resonates with as many of the younger generation anymore because it isn't that, hey, have you seen Donnie Darko type mm -hmm. thing going around with it? I had that really bad sequel made to it as well. Uh, what was that, that Sammy uh, Darko or something like that? It was like S. Darko or something like that. S. Darko. It's about that his it. sister. And like it was serviceable, but it's it doesn't live up to the legacy of the original but I don't know. You don't hear, you don't have a bunch of people talking about Mad World anymore. The yeah. The way they did when this movie came out. What an iconic song that is. <laughs> um, and it's funny because then I'm we're going to go into Inland Empire first. Inland Empire used to be pretty simple to find. It was on Netflix for the longest time. And now they charge $58 just to buy a DVD of it. That's US dollar. That's not Canadian dollar. That's US dollar. 58 of them. Just to buy the DVD because it is impossible to find. It's not on any streaming service. It's just nowhere to be found. It's very similar to the William Hurt movie where he won Best a Actor, uh, Kiss of the Spider Woman. It is nowhere to be found. And I don't know what it is about movies like this, especially a Lynch movie. How does a Lynch movie fall off this much? What I'm thinking is going to happen in the very near future is we're going to see Criterion Collection pick this movie up once whoever has the rights to it ends up dying out. Mulholland Drive is getting a Criterion release. There's already some movies. Uh, I don't know which Lynch movies, but some of them are on Criterion. And I think Inland Empire will ultimately be picked up by that. But Inland Empire came out in 2006. Laura Dern, Justin Thoreau, Jeremy Irons, three pretty popular actors. And it is one of the most bizarre movies I've ever seen in my life. And I say that um, very respectfully. But I want to I want to start off with this because I think this is important. So this is from an article interviewed at the Venice Film Festival. Laura Dern admitted that she did not know what Inland Empire was about or the role she was playing, but hoped that seeing the film's premiere at the festival would help her learn more. Justin Thoreau has also stated that he couldn't possibly tell you what the film's about. And at this point, I don't know that David Lynch could. It's become sort of a pastime. Laura and I sit around on set trying to figure out what's going on. In an NPR interview, Dern recounted a conversation she had with one of the movie's new producers, Jeremy Alter. He asked if Lynch was joking when he requested a one-legged woman, a monkey, and a lumberjack by 315. <laughs> Dern replied, yeah, you're on a David Lynch movie, dude. Sit back and enjoy the ride. Dern reported that by 4 p.m. they were shooting with the requested individuals. To me, that not only defines David Lynch, that just that is that is Inland Empire, that is David Lynch's career, that is David Lynch's whole mentality in a nutshell. I think what people love so much about David Lynch is that you will never see anything like a David Lynch movie, as we just talked about Donnie Darko being like David Lynch, unless you're watching David Lynch. 
even as you're watching Donnie Darko, you know it's not a David Lynch movie because it still tells enough of a straightforward story. <laughs> David Lynch is not going to do that, except for in the movie The Straight Story. Who would have thought? And The Elephant Man. Those are two very straightforward movies. They're also huge blockbuster. I mean, Straight Story is a Disney movie. Yeah. Rated G for anybody keeping track at home. Richard Farnsworth gets the Oscar nom. But... Inland Empire's first hour, I said it, and John was like, you got to be kidding me, but it's so normal by Lynch standards. It's still one of the weirdest hours in movies you're ever going to watch, but by Lynch standards, it's so normal. The last two-thirds of this movie, though, I will honestly say are some of the most disturbing in, in a still artistic, crazy, mm -hmm. nonsensical, disaster kind of way. It is so much fun. And I love sitting down and watching it. And this is only the second time I've watched it. But I love sitting down and watching it and saying to myself, I think I know what's going on this time. And then pretty much at the end, pulling a, a gym from the office, staring at a camera that doesn't exist and just going, because it is ridiculous. I have no idea what is going on by the end of this movie. But it's so much fun. I really, really love it. And uh I, I, I give it three and a half, not the full four. It's not Lynch's favorite. I know when a lot of these big film critics were doing their top movies of the of that yeah. decade, Mulholland Drive and Inland Empire were appearing on a lot of people's lists in their top tens. I couldn't disagree more with the Inland Empire one, but I do understand the fun in a movie like this. And it does have some of the all-time scariest scenes in cinema history, and I'm not exaggerating. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. scene where Laura Dern runs up to the camera and just gets right in it, is one of the most terrifying things ever. The loud noise where the guy hits the woman is ridiculous. There are so many parts. The clown face at the end. Like, yes. it is terrifying. And it does such a good job with tone and setting and all of that. And now it's John's turn to speak. But that's <laughs> why I chose Inland Empire. And it's just weird. It needs to be experienced. And don't try to figure it out. Just watch it. There's no other way to explain this than the fact that I said what the fuck probably every five minutes while watching this movie. I feel that. No other way to put it. It's, it's just, that's the experience you have watching almost any David Lynch movie, but especially Inland Empire. I was sitting there thinking, I'm a, I'm a big Lynch fan. I'm a huge Twin Peaks fan. It's my favorite TV show of all time. Twin Peaks is so tame compared to Inland Empire. And you see with The Return where Lynch got a lot of his ideas and he yeah. brought them in from Inland Empire. He he took a lot of the ideas and you can see how Lynch kind of evolved over time. Mm -hmm. But you want to introduce someone to David Lynch, you give him something like Blue Velvet. Yeah. It's pretty straightforward, easy enough to follow, but it's still got that Lynchy vibe. You want to want to take them to the next level, you give him Twin Peaks. Then you take him to mm -hmm. Mulholland Drive. And then when you when you're really sure they're ready for David Lynch, you give them Inland Empire. Mm -hmm. And they're going to tell you they're not ready for David Lynch. Yeah. Because now, I don't is... know if anyone could ever be ready for just this unbridled David Lynch that Inland Empire is. It really is. It's him just going off the rails and not caring. I think he knew uh, after the success of Mulholland Drive, he didn't really care anymore. And I think that's the funny thing about David Lynch. I don't think he ever really cared. I don't think he ever really cared if people liked his movies or not. He's got a very Terrence Malick vibe to him. Um, they make incredibly different movies, but they have they have a very similar vibe. They have a very similar, like, this is my art. This is what I do. If you like it, you like it. And you not only do you like it, you love it. If you don't love it, whatever. What's funny is the first time I watched this movie, it actually was the first David Lynch movie a friend of mine watched. Whoa. And so I watched this in high school. It was my junior year of high school. I believe it was my junior year of high school. And it was me, one of my friends who loved David Lynch. And then our friend who was a very, very religious, he's now a pastor somewhere. Mm -hmm. He, what, you know, he just like, oh, I like weird stuff. Like a really just weird guy. And we sat down and watched it. And I remember him being so enthralled by it and just being like, what are we watching? Like, what are we doing? And he was that kind of person who would talk in a movie anyway. But he was so confused. And then I'm watching with my friend who knows Lynch. And I remember when the face came up on the screen the first time when she runs at it, he goes, just pause it. Just stop. I can't. I can't. Like, I need a second. Because it's yeah. so bizarre and it's weird. But you're getting these very different reactions to everything. And 
like it is the most Lynch of the Lynch movies. I guess Lost Highway could kind of be thrown in there as maybe the most Lynch. Mulholland Drive is weird, but Mulholland Drive is actually very easy to piece together if you really think about it. Like it's not difficult. It's a death dream or however you want to perceive that. Yeah. But it's not difficult to figure out what's real, what's not, and kind of piece together these whole things with the, the parents and all the Hollywood stuff. That's not hard. This movie, you literally can't put it together. Because at first I was like, okay, the affair is what sets her off. So the affair happens, and now she's imagining herself as a whore, and it's all the people who slept with Justin Theroux and everything. And then the last 20 minutes just make it so, nope, that theory's gone. You're not allowed to have mm -hmm. that theory anymore. Because the last 20 minutes of this movie – make zero sense like they literally don't make sense it's very entertaining to watch but what am i watching it doesn't make any sense however because it's lynch i'm like sure whatever go along with it if this was paul thomas anderson i'd be like dude you're a dick you suck at making movies now <laughs> but it's david lynch it's so funny that he can get away with it but if david lynch tried to make a movie about 15 different characters living in the san fernando valley i'd probably say dude you don't know what you're doing because mm -hmm. that's PTA's thing. And these auteurs can just get away with whatever they want to get away with as long as it fits what the expectation is of the audience. David Lynch knows what his expectation is. He does. And, I mean, this is a man who's literally reported the weather every day since, like, 2005. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, this man does not care what anyone else thinks. He almost canceled his weather broadcast. Until fans were like, no, 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 we need our daily David Lynch yeah. update. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, this is how rabid the fans are for David Lynch. That him spending 10 minutes in the morning describing the weather in L.A. gets everyone in a tizzy when he says he's going to stop doing it. Mostly and guess what? The weather in L.A. is the exact same every single day, just so everybody knows. Yeah. Well, I mean, everyone got in a tizzy mostly because he does have a project in the works. He said there was a special announcement, and the announcement was he was ending his weather broadcasts and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Ugh, didn't go over well but what david lynch does david lynch isn't scared to try anything mm -hmm. and that's really what makes lynch so lynch phil put in his review for this movie that the first hour is so tame by david lynch within five minutes i'm texting him being like what are you talking about mm -hmm. Rabbits. Because we're, we have this polish <laughs> movie we have scenes from rabbits david lynch's unaired sitcom from um, mm -hmm. like 99 it's i was just like how can this totally be tame and then like the rest of the hour happens it feels fine and then the second hour happens and you're like never mind that was nothing mm -hmm. because like you said is this some fever dream is it she just like the affair triggers her into going into it who knows? No one can explain what this movie is about because no one knows what this movie is about. Yeah. When they were trying to promote this movie, the promotion team literally had no idea what to say about it. They a took woman David in Lynch's, trouble. A woman in trouble is the tagline for this movie because mm -hmm. that's the description David Lynch gave them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't tell you anything about this movie. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Because which woman is in trouble? Is it Laura Dern? Is it the 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 lost girl, as they call her? Why is the lost girl freed at the end? What happens to Laura Dern? I have no idea. I have no idea. At the beginning, though, it does seem straightforward. There, she's mm -hmm. trying to get this role. She moves into a weird place. Weird things happen. Feels very Naomi Watts. I know that yeah. we're watching the sitcom, but it's almost like we have this prostitute watching, uh, you know, this play out as if she's and then oh now she's watching laura dern's life play out all of that laura dern in a movie all of a sudden she's starting to get caught up in it because she has an affair and now she feels bad about it and it's a guilt thing with the affair it really all makes sense it really does she's Until going around we get to she's, that point sorry continue no i was just gonna say she's going around she's doing all this normal stuff like we have her you know talking about doing this and that and like kind of taking on these different personalities and which one is the real her and which ones are acting and all of that and blah, blah, blah. And then we just get to this ending where I'm just like, what? Well, okay. we get to the point where David Lynch says, Hey, time travel. Yeah. And you're like, wait, mm -hmm. back it up. David Lynch. I understand that Nikki's kind of becoming her character and getting engrossed in it and everything kind of losing her self identity. But now you're saying, hey, remember this scene like an hour ago where someone interrupted this rehearsal? Yeah, that was Nikki interrupting the rehearsal. But it was Nikki from the future because, like, 
I know it's tomorrow, but yesterday is today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All that fun like, Lynch stuff. <laughs> David Lynch just decides – David Lynch has, like, a through line in most of his works. And it's pretty – it's pretty apparent. A lot of his works are interconnected in subtle ways. Uh, mm -hmm. There are tons of theories about it with, like, Mulholland Drive being connected to Twin Peaks and how, like, mm -hmm. pretty much any time you ever see someone singing – Laura Harding and uh, and Naomi Watts are the rabbits. Yeah, exactly. Right, and like every time you see some sort of performance or anything like that, or you're just like stuck in a weird place, it's probably the Black Lodge from Twin Peaks. Maybe mm -hmm. who knows? David Lynch could just be doing this all as a big joke on us, but it's so wonderful because of it. Yeah, and we talked about this when we were talking about Wes Anderson a couple weeks ago. How Wes Anderson has this like troop of actors he brings back over and over again. David Lynch does the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. People who work yeah. with David Lynch <clears throat> love working with him and continue working with him all the time. Yeah, it's it's really interesting uh, how he's able to keep bringing back the same people, and he brings back like a list talent. I mean, Justin Thoreau mm -hmm. at the time was an a list talent. The Leftovers was really a shock that they put him in a leading role yeah. on an HBO series because he was older and all that. But Justin Thoreau is a hell of an actor. I mean, him in the yeah. Leftovers, like his performance is absolutely out of control. Never gets nominated for an Emmy or anything like that. But that's because people are scared to watch good TV. Um, but Naomi Watts is a massive name. Like, by the mm -hmm. time 2006 rolls around, for her to put on a rabbit costume and say, sure, I'll be in that, that's a big deal. Like, she'd done a Maurice Perros by then, 21 Grams, or she wasn't in a Maurice Perros, I'm thinking 21 Grams. But she's done 21 Grams by then. Like, she's been nominated for Oscars. What is going on here? But they just like David Lynch. That's mm -hmm. the thing. They just like him. Laura Dern has been in multiple David Lynch movies. They just She just oh. likes David Lynch. And I think the thing is, like, there's something authentic about him. And... Like, you don't sit down and watch a David Lynch movie unless it's a straight story or unless it's uh, Elephant Man. You don't sit down and watch those movies for the story. You sit down and watch it for the experience. It's you, You're you watching this movie for the visuals to just, like, get caught up in what bizarreness am I going into. I personally hate the Twin Peaks, The Return, but my expectations are were that he was going to tell me a straightforward story like Twin Peaks was. And he didn't do that. And I watched Kyle McLaughlin walk around like an idiot robot for 20 episodes just for them to play the really good music and have him become normal 21 episodes in. And me go, that's what I wanted from episode one. This is stupid. I don't need to watch him be half this, half that, evil this, blah, blah, blah. I hated it. I hated every second of it except for the black and white episode where everything explodes. It's one of the coolest episodes of TV ever. But my expectations were wrong for that because of mm -hmm. what had preceded it with Twin Peaks. And people say Fire yes. Walk With Me is confusing and hard to follow. That's a lie. So, that's bullshit. Fire Walk With Me follow. is a <laughs> phenomenal movie. But it's okay. We'll talk about it later. <laughs> we'll talk about it later. But like Inland Empire, Mahollin Drive, Lost Highway, Wild at Heart. You're not sitting down a racer head. I mean, fuck you, racer head. But anyway, you don't sit down to watch these movies for the story or anything like that. You're watching it for the experience. And I think that that's so important to remember when you sit down to watch certain directors. I mean, and yeah, David Lynch is not for everybody. That's he, he, he's not supposed to be. If he was for everybody, the world would be a really messed up place. But it's still. The people who do love him, there is something to be said for it, what he is doing, and that nobody else is able to do. And I just think Inland Empire is just him saying, screw it. I don't care. Here's a three-hour movie. It's his longest movie. It's his weirdest one since Eraserhead, which I don't know how he got made. AFI gave him money for that. I have no idea. I have no idea. She stomps on sperm babies. Like, what am I watching in that movie? And so... I just think that, you know, Inland Empire as an experience, I really don't think anything can compare. Inland Empire as a movie, there's a lot of movies better than Inland Empire. But as an experience, as just a, why are they speaking Polish? Why are we watching these things happen? Why are we watching an entire scene where they dance to the locomotion? What is going on in this movie? It is unlike anything you will ever watch in a movie ever. And it's not doing it. I, I think also what helps it is it's Lynch. It's not doing it because it's some director who doesn't know how to tell a story or doesn't know what they're doing and they're just trying to out weird whoever. This is a guy who is doing exactly what he set out to do and he made mm -hmm. this. That's unbelievable. 
Yeah, I mean, that's the most impressive thing about Lynch is if anyone else made this film, mm -hmm. he'd be laughing stock. Everyone would be like, what are you doing? But every single moment is so intentional. Mm -hmm. And Lynch just is able to... He doesn't have to explain his movies. He never does. And you and I both wrote in our reviews, that's the beauty of Lynch. The beauty of Lynch is not, hey, I'm going to sit down here and totally understand everything I see for the next couple of hours. Mm -hmm. The beauty of Lynch is you're going to sit down and you're going to spend all that time trying to figure out what's going on. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. that's what makes it so fun. Like, you said Lynch isn't for everyone. I told my roommate I was watching a three-hour David Lynch movie and he was like, there's no way in hell I will ever sit yeah. down and watch that with you. And I'm like, that's okay. Because mm -hmm. I'm going to watch it and I'm going to enjoy it. And it's wild to think that a move Lynch made Lynch hand shot this movie. Yeah, I know. I this know is, it's so his fun. first digital movie. He shot it on a handheld Sony DSR PD one fifty. It's hilarious. And it, it feels like it. It feels like it's a home movie. I mean, half the time you can't see what's going on because it's too far away. That doesn't yeah. happen with professional cameras, kids. No, this is a handheld camera that Lynch is himself has in his hand, is filming every single thing. This is the movie that made Lynch say he would never make a movie on film again. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because he loved the experience of filming digitally. That's wild that mm -hmm. this is the movie that did that. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you know... I always think about me, me and one of my friends, we always joke about like, you know, if you if you were to sit down with a Tarantino script, everybody would throw it out. If you sat down with a Paul Thomas mm -hmm. Anderson script, everybody would throw it out. Because at the end of the day, a lot of these people who are breaking into the film industry or trying to break into the film industry, if they don't have the connections. They're sending in their script to a company that's going to an intern. I've been that intern. I have no clout. And I'm reading it and saying stupid and throwing it out like that's it. That's that's the chance you're getting. Mm -hmm. And it's so funny because anything with Lynch or Tarantino or anything like that would just get thrown in the garbage. But mm -hmm. because they got in, because they got started, and I, again, erase your head, how is that what you got started with? But but because they got started, they're allowed to just have control like this. David Lynch made a lot of people a lot of money throughout his career. So he's allowed mm -hmm. to make Inland Empire because he made a lot of people a lot of money. And we're and and because of that though, we get to watch Inland Empire. Now, granted, if you if you if you can't find it, you gotta spend 50 something dollars to buy it, but we get to watch a movie like Inland Empire, which has no business ever being made. And I think that's why it's got such a cult following for those who can find it, because you're like again, I just keep saying, but you're never gonna experience something like this in another movie. Movies like this don't get made every year. At the end of the day, a Donnie Darko nowadays, we're getting one Donnie Darko per year. We're getting some weird movie that has a weird teenager who's troubled. We're getting that every time, whether it's got time travel or a giant bunny, that's up in the air. But we're always getting these Donnie Darko-esque, Donnie Darko influenced movies. I talked about um we're going to be talking about next week the cabin in the woods. It's making fun of the movies we get literally every single year. Inland Empire is a once in a possibly lifetime movie. I'm sure there will be one that comes out down the road, but in the 120 years of cinema, whatever it is at this point, there is no other movie that's like Inland Empire that's also being intentionally done by somebody as brilliant as David Lynch. And that's what's important about it. There's a lot of really crappy, pretentious movies that are made like Inland Empire, but they're not as good as Inland Empire because the intention is not to be good. It is to be weird. And that's the difference. Lynch just made what Lynch thought was good. That was it. And this is what he made. And we're so lucky that it is. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I agree. I'm a, I'm a big fan. I mean, I, I do really like this one. I would say in the grand scheme of Lynch movies, this is probably in like my, my top portion. Um, like, but, but then like, you, you know, Mulholland Drive, Blue Velvet, The Elephant Man, yeah. those are kind of my, my top tier. I like this a lot more than like Wild at Heart. I like this a lot more than Eraserhead. I really despise <laughs> Eraserhead. I really hate that movie. Um, but I definitely put this up there as like, this is a man in command of whatever the hell he was trying to do. Yeah. 
Yep, and it's their effect. And it doesn't matter what David Lynch does. When, once Wisteria finally drops on Netflix, Netflix will probably regret mm -hmm. buying a David Lynch feature, and everyone will love Netflix for doing it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and it's just crazy. Like when you start looking at the people who are in this movie, William H. Macy's in this movie. Diane Ladd is in this movie. Uh, Mary Steenburgen is in this movie. How did he get Terry Crews is in this movie? Yeah. How did he get all these people? Harry Dean Stanton to just keep getting money. What is that supposed to symbolize? What is Harry Dean Stanton being so poor? He can't take care of himself supposed to symbolize. feels like it feels like a continuation of Mulholland Drive yeah. more than anything. It does. And it does. It, you, I mean, it does kind of have that aspect of it where it's like that, that critique of like Hollywood and everything. And it has that aspect where, like I said earlier on, like a lot of Lynch's films feel interconnected in mm -hmm. this one. So here's a grand hypothesis about Inland Empire. Nikki doesn't exist. Okay. Nikki is the character and the lost girl is actually the actress. Hmm. And how does the loss, but the lost girl is the actress. So I, why is she acting? I don't know. Exactly. Okay. There I you go. don't fine. know, but that's where I've gotten so far. Okay. Yeah. It's going to be the take only like way I can explain viewings. the ending. Yeah. It's going to take like 10 more viewings. No, it, it has something to do with her being freed. I tried looking up some, some Reddit threads and stuff like that afterwards. Nobody knew what they were talking about. Everybody's like, no, it no. was this. No, it was that. But then they all admit at the end of it, like, that's just my interpretation. It's a movie that can only have interpretation. And I think that's what's yes. so cool about it. Like this is a movie that if you had 40 different people write up what they thought about this movie, what they thought it was about, you'd never get the same answer. Whereas with Mulholland Drive, you have 40 people do it. Each one might have a little nuance that's different, but at the end of the day, everybody can kind of sum up what that movie is. That's also why Mulholland Drive is a much better movie and why Mulholland Drive is a masterpiece is because it does have the Lynch-isms, but it also is just a really, really great movie with some of the best scenes in movies ever, such as Yoriando and um and the winkies and like these just bizarre yeah. scenes that all actually add up to something inland empire doesn't really add up to anything that's okay though mm -hmm. i'm okay with it not adding up to anything yeah huh. all right let's let's move on from this um just because you know it wasn't actually a top hundred movie, but you know still <laughs> still pretty freaking wild and rad i guess rad right where this was a rad yeah. movie oh yeah um john what was your what was the best thing you watched this week I watched a couple of things. I mean, the best thing I watched was Beauty and the Beast because it was that time of the year again to watch Beauty and the Beast again. There you go. But there are like very few movies that are better than Beauty and the Beast. So hard to beat that. Uh, other than that, I, I rewatched Blades of Glory, which I will say is superior to Step Brothers. You're wrong, but Blades of Glory is hilarious. I love the uh, the JFK so Marilyn Monroe funny. ice skating thing. Oh, that it's absolutely it, it's great. John Heater. I don't know what happened to him, but what happened? That's a great back. question, though. What <laughs> happened to John Heater? Like Napoleon Dynamite, that school for scoundrels. Goodbye. Where do you go? I don't know, but we miss you, John Heater. Please come back and give us some more of your fantastic comedy. But I, I watched a movie I was actually kind of disappointed in, which was um, The Harder They Fall, which was that western. It just dropped on Netflix this weekend. And it's uh, a Western with uh, Jonathan Major, Idris Elba, Regina King, and Lakeith Stanfield. Oh, I do know which one you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know exactly. I had heard very good things about it. And it was just, it was it was okay. It was good. It was serviceable. But it wasn't as good as I would hope it would be. Uh, but I guess if we're talking a movie out of my top 100, that was the best I watched. I rewatched The Princess Bride this week because mm -hmm. I needed something to decompress with after Inland Empire. And that movie is just, it's the perfect movie to do that type of thing too. And it's just such a great feel good movie. I followed up Inland Empire with Wild Strawberry, so I wasn't really oh, doing fine. myself any favors. Yeah. Um, no, I, I I love Blades of Glory. Um, big, big fan of that. I'm a huge fan of The Princess Bride. I got to see that in the Hollywood Forever Cemetery. That was a great experience. And uh, that's one of those movies that I'm always like, is this going to end up in my top 100 one day? It probably never will, but it's definitely a movie that I go back to like year after year after yeah, year. I absolutely. love the storybook element of it. Um, I watched a lot 
I watched a whole bunch. I went from uh, as soon as we got off the podcast last week, I went and watched Thanks Killing, which is great. And then the next day I went into Elf and Kloss just to get myself right into uh, right into um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, it's Christmas Spirit. Claus is very good. I was very impressed. Um, very, very good movie. The best thing I watched was Wild Strawberries. I'm going through the Ingmar Bergman thing, which I'm using as my stand right here. So there it is. Um, I'm going through that. And that was like the next one up in the way that Criterion Collection designed it. So I was like, yeah, I'll watch it again. It's such a masterpiece. It's definitely, it's higher than number 58 on my list when I eventually redo a list. Um, but the two movies that I'll talk about that I haven't talked about yet, uh, I would say that I'd probably lean with the orphanage as the best movie I watched this week. It was a big rewatch. I hadn't seen that since it came out in theaters. It is just a master class in horror filmmaking. It really is just a fantastic movie. A uh, woman who was an orphan at this orphanage leaves, comes back, moves in with her husband and her kid, haunted house elements, all of that. But the twists just keep coming. Jay Bayona directed it. Guillermo del Toro pre presents it, whatever the hell that means. And it has some genuinely creepy scenes. There's this scene with the, where they're playing this kid's game called one, two, three, knock on the wall. Oh, I have chills just thinking about it right now. It is so good. Uh, it really captures it all. And it's, it's what I love so much about it is it's a horror movie that makes you feel sad. It makes you feel scared. It makes you like laugh at parts and it just, it captures all of that. That's not something that you get all the time from horror movies. A lot of horror movies are just trying to scare you. This movie is incredibly emotional. Um, and then the one I watched today that's just a little bit below it, but a great one, is The Specialists, which is a Sergio Carbucci movie, um, if I'm saying his last name correct. Um, it's a spaghetti western from 1969. Spaghetti westerns are impossible to properly rank because they're either really entertaining or they really yeah. suck. This one was fantastic carbucci makes some of the best ones that the great silence all that fun stuff so definitely check that out if you're in the spaghetti westerns and if you're not go watch the orphanage because everybody loves horror and it's horror with heart which is a very weird thing to say anyway speaking of sort of horror sort of heart sort of just freaking weird donnie darko john 2001 what do you got donnie darko like i said it's it's lynchian it's got those lynchian vibes and I realized on this rewatch, Donnie Darko is like my introduction into this Lynchian field. I mm. I can't say it was much later than 2001 when I watched this for the first time. And I loved it. I, I loved every aspect of it. I loved the weirdness of the interactions within the people. I loved the, the time travel aspect of it. I loved just that opening shot where Donnie just wakes up which is exactly what you would expect from a David Lynch movie, by the way, where you just get Donnie mm -hmm. Darko gets up on his bike, rides into town. Yeah. And I re I just realized on this rewatching that this really did kind of springboard me into more, like more of this more artistic film. This isn't a very artistic movie in the end. It's, it's mm -hmm. pretty straightforward. It's, it doesn't have, too many like incredible shots or anything like that from a storytelling standpoint it's a little weirder mm -hmm. and the characters are a little strange a little out of place there is no scene in this movie that's more lynchian than and there's a fat guy watching us mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but it, this just kind of sprung this just got me going for everything else and whereas this movie nowadays like we were talking it's, it's kind of faded off into the background when this movie came out, it was talked about a lot. And it really, it's the reason why Jake Gyllenhaal is so popular nowadays anyways. I remember when this came out, um, I remember I was friends with this kid and it was 2000, probably 2002-ish. And it was like mm -hmm. when people still had like HBO, people were just watching yeah. cable and it was always on HBO. How is this happening? It was always, always, always on HBO. And so... We would, we would watch, we weren't watching it, but then this kid's older brother who was like six or seven years older than us, he would always talk about it. Always mm -hmm. talk about like what a great movie it was. Oh, you guys got to check it out, blah, blah, blah. And we were like, all right, whatever. And I never really thought much of it. The kid didn't have the best taste in movies or anything like that. And I watched it. And I was like, ah, oh, man, that the, the whole thing of how the rabbit came to be is such a cool idea. Mm -hmm. 
there's some really cool moments with him like talking to the rabbit and you can see like the schizophrenia and stuff like that. Like there's a lot of really cool stuff in this. I do knock this movie a little bit for that artistic element. I do think that Richard Kelly was trying very hard with this movie. And I think most of it lands, but the parts that don't land, it's like, you're just trying to be weird for the sake of being weird at certain points or, or it just feels like, okay, like, cool. It's edgy. I get it. But Gyllenhaal is amazing. Maggie Gyllenhaal is amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Jenna Malone is great in this movie. I love seeing a young Seth Rogen. That just cracks me up that like what he became, but the person who steals this movie is Beth Grant. Beth Grant is ridiculous in this movie. She gets no credit. It is what ultimately led her to being iconic in Little Miss Sunshine, where she is the person who is uh, presenting Little Miss Sunshine. I think she is so great in that movie. Um, she plays pretty much the same role, like the stuck up over the top, whatever. And and I just think like she does such a great job with what they present her. And they don't mm-hmm. give her the same stuff that they give to Jake Gyllenhaal. Obviously this is Gyllenhaal's movie. He gets to be weird, but she gets to be the exact opposite of everything that he's standing for and what this guy is having him do. She's the goody good and all that. And she's bowing down to the church of Patrick Swayze, who ends up being a weirdo. And, and I love this idea of like Donnie Darko unveiling all of the dark secrets while this person who's so good, good on the outside is actually just despicable on the inside. Oh, we got to do something to help this guy. It's like he had child porn. Like, what are you, what are you talking about? Like, it's insane, but she steals it for me. I think she's absolutely phenomenal. Um, I, I, it's just, there's not enough roles like that in movies. So unfortunately there just really weren't many areas for her to go, but she's great. in No country for old men. She's great. In Little miss sunshine. I mean, she's just, she's just top notch. I'm a big, yeah. big Beth Grant fan. And I think she's just fantastic in this movie. She is. And a lot of that just comes from the energy she brings this character. Because, this, like you said, this character is kind of like the opposite of everything this movie is going for. It's this dark, edgy movie. It's going for these deeper themes. It's trying to tackle like this idea of like mental illness versus time travel versus like accepting death. And mm-hmm. the, the, some really heavy themes. And then we kind of have this villain who's so over the top and comedic that it just brings this kind of fresh air to the film Mm -hmm. to make it a little more palatable because if this was all just heavy topic after heavy topic after heavy topic this would be a hard movie to digest but it has that levity because it has (laughs) miss farmer saying things like he told me to forcibly (laughs) insert the love or the fear and love lifeline up my anus. Mm-hmm. 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 Like, She's great. It's great. It's so comedic. It's so perfect. And it, it just gives this movie exactly the touch it needs in order to take it from this dark, brooding cult classic to this more openly accepted cult classic. Yes, 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 yes. And and I think like it's it's an easier movie to digest than it was made to seem in 2001. Mm-hmm. And I think like, you know, we just talked about Inland Empire. Mulholland Drive comes out the same year as this one. Yeah. Mulholland Drive is a much harder movie to digest than this. And I don't even think Mulholland Drive is that hard to digest. But Donnie Darko, like, it's pretty straightforward what's going on in this movie. And even the ending, it's kind of like he's put the pieces back together. He was where he was supposed to be. And, and the time travel aspect of everything just ends because he was supposed to land there. Now you could talk, call this whole movie a dying dream. Is that essentially what it is where he actually was killed and he imagined like going through his entire life without being killed? Who knows? It's up to you really how you want to interpret it. But I think that like it does do a cool thing with the rabbit and with him going around like why is the rabbit choosing specific people to target? I think that's really fun. And I also think that it it leads to some really interesting stuff as the movie goes on, which is what keeps you compelled as the mysteries of what's going on with Donnie Darko unfold. Yeah. Especially because in the end, all these actions that happen throughout the movie ultimately lead to this decision. Donnie makes at the end of the film, Mm -hmm. which is he's realized the devastation he's left in his path from not dying that night. And he knows he needs to go back. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then and then we get that beautiful scene of Jill and Hall just laughing in the bed as this jet engine crushes him. Yep. 
it, it, it's a gorgeous way of wrapping it up. The time travel aspect of this movie, very, very high caliber, very hard to comprehend because it's kind of a closed time travel loop in which none of the events can happen without Donnie going back, mm-hmm. except for the plane crashing in the first place. The mm-hmm. only thing that's different is that his family's not on said plane when it crashes. Yeah, I know. That was the one part here that I was like, wait, what's going on with this? That did confuse me. I will not lie. So, because the the plane would be flying no matter what. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, like, that jet engine can still go through the um, through the wormhole and everything and come back down no matter what. But his family's not on that plane, which is... Oh, the gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Right, because because the family wouldn't... Because none of the events that led the family to be on the plane in the first place would have happened without Donnie specifically inciting them. Like, first off, Donnie's death is going to make it so the sparkle motion probably doesn't get noticed at this talent show. But mm-hmm. on top of mm-hmm. that, Patrick Swayze's never revealed to be a pedophile. So Miss Farmer would be the one who goes to LA with them if they did still go to LA. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, that makes more sense. Okay, I get that now. I get that. I do love the mystery around this though. Early on, where it's like, what mm-hmm. is? How did this? How did this uh, engine fall? They can't find the plane. Yes. What's going on? Like, I think that's such an interesting, and I love that it's over the the mundane conversations of I'm going to vote for Dukakis. Oh, you really think? Like, like I love that. Like. This movie still does a very good job of capturing the era that this was. Like, it's very, like, mm-hmm. post-Reagan leading into the first Bush. Like, what's going on with all this? You're starting to have, like, the teens be like, no, I don't want to be like my parents. I don't agree with this. There's whatever's going on with the disparity and the income disparity and all that. And so they're starting to push against this. And I love how that is set up and how that's conditioned. And they don't really say to you, like, hey, side with Maggie Gyllenhaal or side with the parent, because it's not mm-hmm. what's important. It's what the conversation is. It's the same thing how, like, we're, we all end up going against pretty much what our parents wanted to be. That's, that's just how it goes. And in 20 years, our kids might have a very different take than what we have. That's probably what's going to happen. So – I love that it captures that essence. And this was in 2001. So really that time was only 10 to 15 years earlier. It really wasn't mm-hmm. all that much earlier than um, than when this was taking place. Now we look back at it and we're like, holy shit, who's Michael Dukakis? Um, yep. But I love that it does that. And that it's letting you know, like, this is the time period this is taking place. So maybe there is some sort of, like, government conspiracy. Of course the teens would think that kind of thing. That's what they were thinking at this time. I love that they introduce those elements because it does keep you on the edge of your seat as Donnie, who we know is definitely crazy, is just kind of continuing to be crazy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that's part of the of this film is the fact that throughout the film, you're always questioning whether or not Donnie's reliable as a narrator because you know he is suffering from mental illness. It, mm-hmm. It's very clearly put forward at the very beginning of the film. And he's seeing... This rabbit, he's seeing Frank, this rabbit, this terrifying looking rabbit. It's like, where is this coming from? No one else sees him. It's telling him to do these things, which are exposing people. Why? And is this just Donnie's subconscious? Is this a creation of his of his mind that is like controlling him? What's going on? And as we progress further and further on, we, we're still kind of led to believe that until we get to the reveal of who Frank is at the end of the movie. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. And and I mean, the first time you're watching this movie, are you thinking that fr- like that this rabbit is totally of his imagination? Like, what were you thinking? Because the whole time I was watching, I was like, it's kind of weird. Like, what is this? And like, why is this the vision he's having? I really like that it's grounded in, re- in a reality and that it's like the future coming back to the past, just like he ends up coming back to the past. But what did you think about this? Like, what were you thinking the first time you're watching? Do you remember? <laughs> That was so long ago, Phil. Yeah, I, 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 I was probably just thinking, "Oh my God, what is this rabbit? What's going on?" And especially because yeah. we get the scene where uh, Donnie stabs Frank's eye, and mm-hmm. then we finally get the scene where they're watching Evil Dead, and Frank takes off his mask, and you see his eyes injured, and you're like, "Oh, Donnie must have done that when he was stabbing his eye." That totally mm-hmm. makes sense. And then you get to the point where Donnie actually shoots Frank in the eye, and you're like, "That makes a lot more sense." Yeah. Yep. 
Yeah. No, and, and this one handles kind of, uh, you know, like teenage angst movies are always fun because people like they'll always go back to those. And especially when it's got like a sci fi element or something mm -hmm. to it. This one really does do a good job of of capturing that sci fi element. I mean, even when they get to the party and it's mm -hmm. like, OK, Donnie and Jenna Malone, what are they going to do? And then it gets into you just have Maggie Gyllenhaal going. Where's Frank? Where did Frank go? Oh, he went out to get some beer. And you're like, wait, Frank's a real person. And we're in like the last 15 minutes of this movie. Something's about to happen with Frank. Frank, there's going to be a Frank who's going to do something. But why in a rabbit suit? And um, like, I like that. Like, it doesn't it doesn't feel like a cop out. I do like some some movies would go a different route with this where they really would just make it a six foot tall bunny. And that was it. But this one had that plan the entire time of like, no, it's a bunny from the future because he does this and blah, blah, blah. And now Frank gets to live because because Donnie Darko died. Um, but, you know, it's kind of like a uh, Final Destination before Final Destination started ruining Final Destination. You know, it was like Donnie Darko has this near death experience and all of a sudden he's got some sort of superpower. And what was it that dragged him away for this near death experience in the first place? Because he's just waking up on this road or he's waking up wherever it, 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 it really, really keeps the suspense up uh, pretty mm -hmm. much the entire movie, which is is not cannot be said for a lot of movies of this genre because a lot of times it starts to feel corny or over the top or it just, it kind of loses its way like halfway through. Yeah. I think a lot of that comes down to the way that like the characters are built in this film, because when we look at Donnie, because we're seeing everything through his eyes, we're, we're very sympathetic towards him. We, we know he's struggling with mental health, but we also know he's very smart and very articulate. Mm -hmm. And that's, there's no better scene that should, there's two scenes that really show that it's the first English class where mm -hmm. he's explaining the destructors and when he's explaining Smurfette's origins. Yeah. It just really goes to show the type of person that Donnie is, that, that he's so attentive and that he understands these complex things and that he doesn't let people kind of get away with saying things that aren't true, which it's also kind of leads then, then into this idea of like why he's going after the people he's going to and why Frank's telling him to do these things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love the English class scenes in this movie. I think Drew Barrymore does this pretty well as like the misunderstood teacher and this whole thing mm -hmm. with the destructors and what are we teaching our kids and what are we focusing on and all of that. I think it 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 adds also to that that whole thing of like it always seems like the teachers that high school kids end up liking the most always end up end up getting in the most trouble or having something mm -hmm. go wrong for them because they're actually connecting with the kids and they're not buying into the bullshit. Um Crazy. and 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 I think with this movie it does a good job of doing that without, but we don't really ever get much about Drew Barrymore's character beyond what she's doing. We also know that grandma death is somebody and that mm -hmm. grandma death, like everybody in the school kind of knows who this is and, Oh, she wrote a book and she did this and it's time. to. So like, we know that this school has had some weird teachers in the past, but we don't really get anything beyond seeing Drew Barrymore in the classroom. We don't see her elsewhere. And I think, I think that's a good choice. Like, I think it's cool mm -hmm. to, to, to do this and kind of show her as that, that person who can stand up to the bully kids and that Donnie is, a, you know, going with him when she says to Jenna Malone, um, you know, sit next to the boy you think is the cutest. All I could think was, Oh man, 2021, you know, you'd be in jail, Drew Barrymore forever, oh. ever and ever. Um, but, but I like love those kinds of things. They're such good characterizations. And it also leads to this element of like, is this reality? Is this fantasy? What are we really watching here um, that's, that's taking place even in the school? Yeah, I mean, as someone who's taught for a few years, this is one of the best depictions of a staff I have ever seen in a film. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. it, it covers every aspect of every single Tabor teacher you have. You have that young teacher who's willing to push the boundaries with what they're teaching. That's our Drew Barrymore here, where she's pushing the boundaries, even though Destructors, very tame short story, don't understand why anyone would ever have problems with that, but okay. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have, like, the science teacher who's just there, who is so excited that a student is, like, showing interest in something they're interested in, and they just want to pump them up and give them more opportunities to learn more and more. And then you have the old teacher who thinks they're hip by focusing on this alternative learning method that is totally a bunch of garbage, but no one's really willing to say it to her because she's got seniority and you just can't mm -hmm, do anything mm -hmm. about her. 
And then you have the pushover principal who's just like, okay, well, we have to do something about this, so we're going to fire the English teacher. It's a fantastic mm -hmm. depiction of the bureaucracy of a school and the building of a school staff that is really hard to nail. And that it's just like these side characters that don't aren't overly consequential to the entire film mm -hmm. is so impressive. Yeah. And, and, and those characters that aren't consequential to the film, they're still what, what, what build this world. Because when you're, mm -hmm. when you're making a movie like this, that's like teenagers and, and high school and things like that, you need to make it feel realistic. Even if the bullies are Stephen King bullies, villains, where yep. it's just so over the top that it's not realistic. You need to have, all of these side characters that people can say, man, that is kind of like so-and-so, but it's obviously an exaggeration. You need to, you need to have that. And, and you need to be able to focus in on that because if this movie really was just all Donnie Darko, that would become very stale and very, very dark way too quickly. Mm -hmm. Like it would be too dark because we're dealing with schizophrenia and all of these other things that are, that are going into this. That's tough. And so you need to have characters who kind of break that up and also make it seem like, you know what, like, this happens. It happens to other people. It's not like you're as weird as everybody's also trying to make you seem, Donnie. Um, you know, him and Jenna Malone in this movie, their relationship, like, mm -hmm. yeah, that's that's the 2001 angsty teen, Tim Burton, Richard Kelly, whatever you want to call it, type type relationship. And, and it, for the most part, really works. I mean, the scene mm -hmm. in the movie theater is a pretty, pretty, for cult classics, that's pretty much as recognizable as they come that scene in the movie theater with the two of them and, yep. and the rabbit. I mean, it's yep. pretty much as, as recognizable as they can get. Yeah. I mean, why are you wearing that stupid man suit? It's one of the most yeah. iconic lines from this movie. Does yeah. it mean anything? Not really. No, it yeah. doesn't really connect to the deeper themes of like utilitarianism and things like that, but it's an iconic scene and yeah. it feels great. And it's something that you always remember from this movie. That and Mad World playing over the final montage yeah. there. Yeah, Mad World over the final montage is great. That song gets stuck in my head for like weeks every time <laughs> I watch this. So yeah. What 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 is the deal with Richard Kelly? Why did Richard Kelly not catch on? Why were his next two movies such duds? And and he hasn't done anything since 2009. What is what or 2009 or maybe a little bit later, but either way, uh, he only did the box and Southland Tales. What happened? I don't know. I don't think his his movies were never very mainstream. Like even like Donnie Darko, which is by far his most successful movie, didn't really catch on. The box didn't really get that much acclaim to it at all. No. I mean, and, and it looks like Southland Darko. Tales. It looks like Southland Tales might be the most polarizing movie ever. I'm going. I'm I'm on the the letterbox for right now. There's 980 half star ratings, 1600 one star ratings. 1,200 one and a half star ratings, 2,200 two star ratings, 1,800 two and a half, 2,400 three, 1,700 three and a half, 2,100 four, 946 four and a half, and 1,400 five. Like that's as, that's as like even across the board as you're yeah. going to see any movie. Like, yeah, there's some in the middle there. It definitely is more of like a, a three or whatever its average comes out to be. But it's not like, oh, everybody's in that average. It's all across the spectrum. Like, I don't remember anything about Southland Tales. I don't really know, but it's crazy that with how memorable Donnie Darko still is and how it kind of is in like that mm -hmm. cultural conversation all the time, how Richard Kelly just was never able to figure it out after that. Yeah. I mean, he's doing a lot of things in this movie and in his other films that a lot of other directors are just doing better, mm -hmm. which probably plays into it. But we got everything where it's like looking back at it now it's very good it's very memorable it's but having experienced a lot of david lynch having experienced david lynch this week and then watching donnie darko you can see where its shortcomings are at the same time mm -hmm. oh drop in below call me by your name i can feel it yes Yes, yeah, I can feel it. I can feel it happening. I can tell John's going that route. Yeah. No, Donnie Darko is definitely one of those movies. I think that like this is the perfect movie for 15 to 19 year old boys. Yeah. I really do. I think it's like the perfect yeah, movie for that. 
they 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 starting to date girls or they're starting to date guy whatever they're starting to date and they and it's like hey come watch this movie with me mm -hmm. that's it so, that's it I, and it's a so great we, edgy movie to show somebody and be like wow wasn't that cool it, it's the movie that makes you think you're really smart for liking it yeah and it's a movie that like it, it's a very good gateway movie into weirder subgenres yeah. of film and weirder directors but it doesn't have that quite that lastingness that some of those more iconic films do have. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And a lot of cult classics are like that, though. And that's essentially mm -hmm. why a lot of them do become cult classics and aren't classic classics. Exactly. Because a lot of them, it's a lot of the fun of some of these movies is the fact that you're in on it, that you are a part of mm -hmm. that cult. That's what's part of the following. Like Rocky Horror Picture Show. Yeah, it's an entertaining movie. It's not as great as the people who are in that cult think that movie is. But you have the Evil Dead on yours. There's people who love Eraserhead. Like these are cult classics that like they they're not mainstream, but they do gain more popularity because it's like if you find somebody else who really likes that movie, it's that instant connection. Donnie Darko is definitely that kind of movie. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it has a lot of buzzwords. I think a lot of the reason why 15 to 19 year old boys really attract to this movie has a lot of things. It has a lot of these like philosophical conferences that I think really ignite their minds a lot. Things like everyone who dies is going to die alone. Yeah. And things yeah, like that. Yeah. It, it, like, it's, it's that edginess to it that it's like when you think about it, it's like, that makes a lot of sense. And then you kind of ponder on it a lot and you like think about it and you kind of think about how that's fitting into the overall theme of the film where who's dying alone, right? Because all these people that we do see dying in this film don't die alone. They have people around them at all times. Yeah. So how is that thing into the entirety of the film? And I think that type of my thought process is so good to be having in an accessible movie to young adults and teenagers because it does let them kind of branch into more out there cinema and more mm -hmm. less concrete ideas and more trying to pick the things of something like Inland Empire. It, it, mm -hmm. Inland Empire isn't going to be as accessible to someone who didn't see Donnie Darko when they were like 15 years old. Yeah. Yeah. No, Donnie Darko is a gateway drug. There it is. Yeah. There you go. All right, John, you have anything else on Donnie Darko or should we wrap this thing up? Nope. Nope. That's all, right. all I've got this week. All right, let's jump in. So next week, we finally actually are we're allowed to talk about a movie that's actually on my list, not one that's just, you know, having to replace. Uh, I have Waves from 2019. So I think my newest movie on this list, because I think it technically came out after Parasite. So my newest movie on this list, Waves uh, from 2019. And John has The Cabin in the Woods from 2011. This will be our number 57. So we are just moving right down this list. And uh, yeah, my my warning for Waves is it is one of the most depressing movies you are ever going to watch in your life. And that is coming from somebody who is very um, openly into depressing movies. I don't want to spoil it for anybody, but I just want to throw that warning on the front of this because there's a reason why this movie didn't really get Oscar nominations mm -hmm. or anything like that in 2019. And it's because people did not sit want to sit through this movie. And every time people walked out of it, they didn't feel good. But I will say that it hit me straight in the gut and never stopped. So look forward to watching that. Cabin in the Woods, I saw three times in the movie theater. So I haven't seen it since. Very pumped to see if I still like that movie coming out of all of this. So thank you, everybody. And we will see you next week.